Hello and welcome back. We are looking at bilingual language processing and so far we have covered patterns of acquisition and usage. So age of acquisition, pattern of acquisition and L1 to L2, L1 versus L2 language usage. Now we will look at language mode. The idea of language mode was proposed by Grosjean in 2001 and 8 and um, this basically refers to the state of activation of the languages of a bilingual. So when we are speaking in one language, what is the state of activation of the, the language that is not being used, non-target language. So that is what basically is all about language mode. And the language processing mechanism as per Grosjean theory, language processing mechanism will differ in terms of how active or inactive the non-target language is at, the, at a given point of time. So primarily whether the participant is in a monolingual mode versus bilingual mode or in an intermediate mode, processing strategies will be different. So a bilingual is said to be in a monolingual mode when interacting with a monolingual speaker in only one of their languages. And the same speaker could be in a bilingual uh, mode when there is uh, a bilingual speaker. So in case of a monolingual mode, the other language is said to be deactivated. However, when somebody is in bilingual mode, more often than not, the interaction will be happening with a bilingual speaker. So both speakers are bilingual as a result of which the speaker is considered to be in a bilingual mode. And uh, typically, the one of the criteria will be that both the speaker, both the persons in the conversation are bilingual in the same L1 and L2. As a result of which, both languages are activated and code switching is often an, uh, an, an important aspect of such kind of a conversation. So that is why we say that in a bilingual mode, in the final point of the continuum of bilingual mode, there is a amount of quite a bit of an amount of code switching and code mixing that happens as a result of which we can safely say that both the languages are uh, not only active but they are also being uh, used at the same time. Hence this is the bilingual mode. So these are some of the factors that, uh, that are responsible for uh, positioning of a bilingual on the mode and this we have already talked about. Now there are various studies that have looked at uh, how the mode can affect the processing strategy. So one of these studies by Garcia Serra in 2012, they tried to investigate the relationship between speech perception and language mode and they used event related potential. Event related potentials are the outcome of an EEG. So an EEG machine when it is uh, um, attached to the head and the participant is um, tasked with some something and then the resultant signal that the brain emits which is uh, finally transferred to a computer in, in the form of a sine wave is what is our ERP. So ERP is event related potential. So this changes with respect to as a function of the stimulus given as a function of what the participant is doing. So in this case, the participants were Spanish English bilinguals and they had to identify the deviant stimuli from the repeated sequence of standard stimuli. So typically what happens in this kind of a study, they will look at the MMN. MMN stands for mismatch negativity. Mismatch negativity is a signal in a very a commonly utilized signal in ERP that looks at the mismatched. So when you are listening to a series of stimuli, uh, auditory stimuli let us say in a number of a series of uh, alphabets or series of phonemes, one or two of those phonemes are not part of the language that you know. So there is an, a, a mismatch that happens. So in that case if such a situation occurs, if then this kind of mismatch is part of the stimuli, then we will see the MMN effect in the ERP signal. So that is what they looked at. And they found that the MMN signal changed as a function of the base language. So if the, the deviant stimuli was not part of the base language, they found an MMN effect. So this proved that experimentally manipulating language mode can cause bilinguals to perceive the same stimuli belonging to two different distinct categories. So because <clears throat> they manipulated the uh, language mode in this case and tried to see how the brain perceives that deviant stimuli. So that is what they found out that language mode has an impact on that. And there are many other studies as well. So this is just one of the better known ones. Now we will look at the speech processing among bilingual children. 
Now children are a slightly different case as opposed to bilingual adults because of multiple factors. So for children learning a new language starts from the from listening to the sounds and rhythms of the language. In the very first stage the child is exposed to a child first starts to identify the sounds and rhythms of the languages that they are exposed to. So very small children, infants starting from the age 0, a few months, few days and all. So, they are called universal listener. They are called universal listener because they have a very broad speech perception domain. So, they can, they can perceive n number of stimuli that is given to them and that is why they are called universal listener. As a result of this factor, children can learn any native language, whatever language or languages they are exposed to, they are capable of learning all of them simultaneously without any problem because of this factor of being universal listener. So, over time however, the listeners start to specialize in attending to just the sound contrast of their own language over a period of time and that happens quite rapidly actually. This uh, broad domain of perceptual awareness starts to shrink and gradually it kind of gets focused on the language of their own. So, the native language that they are learning or that they are exposed to, the, it kind of zeroes in on that after a point of time and this process is called perceptual narrowing. So, starting with a very broad spectrum, any kind of sound and, the, and their contrasts they can they are open to however over a period of time that contrast the understanding of the sound perceptual contrast sound contrast gets focused only on the language that they are exposed to. So, speech processing as a perception as a result of this is a very complex process com more complex than adult and this can occur in two ways simultaneous and sequential we have seen uh, simultaneous bilinguals and sequential bilinguals this is related to that idea. So, simultaneous uh, bilinguals just a brush up. Uh, they tune their perceptual system to two native languages from birth. We will not call them L1 and L2 because they are both the languages are being learned at the same time. So, we can call them both as native, native language. So, th at that time if a child is simultaneous bilingual, they will attune their perceptual system to both those, those languages. And as a result of which they have less exposure to each language than monolinguals. This is a continuous uh, variable that we have been talking about. So, they will have less exposure to uh, each of these languages compared to monolinguals because the same amount of time they are dividing between two languages. Now, as a result of this they must mentally represent two languages increasing number of perceptual categories they also must learn within that time. So also their exposure is noisy, it is called noisy and technically it is called noisy because bilingual children often have bilingual caregiver speaking with an accent in one or more languages. In a, in a bilingual simultaneous bilingual environment there are many possibilities. One could be that the, both the parents speak different languages, another could be that they also have a caregiver, third caregiver who have who speak another language and they might have act various different kinds of accents and so on. So, for a child's brain to make sense of what is happening, uh, it has to negotiate this noisy environment. And simultaneous bilinguals need to discriminate and separate their languages and engage in language specific processing gradually. On the other hand, we have sequential bilinguals. Now, when uh, a sequential bilingual is a bilingual who learns their L2 after their L1. So, basically they have an L1 and L2 as opposed to both L1s in case of simultaneous bilinguals. So, in bi sequential bilingual when you are learning your L2, your L1 is already in place. In terms of uh, phonological awareness, they have already their phonological awareness of the contrasts and other factors already in place. On top of that now they are learning the L2 phonological properties. So, a new system. So, children's uh, perceptual sensitivities begin to decline sharply in the first year of life and then this decline continues. So, therefore, when children come across a new language, their perceptual system will be neither as open as an infant's 
not as well established as adults. So, this as a result of which we are looking at it as a separate category. So, infants have as we have seen they are in uh, universal listeners. So, they have a rather open perceptual uh, window and on the other hand adults have already well established perceptual window. So, this sequential bilingual children however, are somewhere in between. So, this is what uh, perceptual narrowing is um, that is what we talked about. So, contrasts received and contrast not received perceived are the these are the two domains that you can see how contrast perceived the domain of perceived uh, contrast can uh, gets broader and broader over period of time. So, birth then first year then preschool as as like this. So, in adulthood the ability to perceive contrast significantly decreases. So, simultaneous bilingual infants now we will look at um, few studies as to how they have uh, the, how they have been investigated. Uh, in case of infants it is not the, the experimental techniques are slightly different as opposed to any other any other participant because they cannot probably be uh, asked to part, uh, take part in certain kinds of stimulus and uh, you know, discriminating them perceiving them and so on. So, there is no direct methods as such because they are not supposed to they cannot be expected to sit down and uh, take part. So, there are different kinds of um, mechanisms that are used for uh, studies on infants. One of them is called high amplitude sucking. So, this is a very common procedure used to investigate sensitivity. So, whether a child is sensitive towards one kind of sound or another kind of sound contrast or not so on. So, this is an indirect method in which the, they look at high amplitude sucking. So, this is used to assess interest in different sounds the more the sucking get at the interest. So, this is the baseline. So, two variants of this procedure exists one test discrimination of different sounds and also preference of different uh, for different sounds. These are the things that are typically studied among infants. One such study looked at uh, if the English Welsh bilingual could discriminate between words in each of the languages. So, they had very small children 2 to 3 years they were not infants, but they were uh, children 2 to 3 years of um, English Welsh bilinguals. The task was children were shown a series of familiar pictures labeled in one or the other language. So, some pictures were labeled in English, some were labeled in Welsh and they were shown. So, several trials of one language followed by trial by in one in another language. So, they were pic shown pictures several uh, of one language then followed by another then uh, like this it, it went on. This was an ERP study and they showed that the bilinguals and the control group of English monolinguals detected the language change. So, when there was pictures uh, having only English label and then it changed into pictures with Welsh label, the ERP signals uh, told them that this is that they could change that they detected the change language change. However, response timing showed a difference suggesting difference in processing. So, the brain understood identify the difference however, the processing took a little bit of time. So, the response time was different. Another kind of studies that have used a head turning preference used to study this is used to study a 7 month old bilingual infants uh, learning L2 with different word orders English and Japanese. So, this is how the setting looks the child will be sitting on his mother's lap and they will uh, listen to various kinds of sound and looking at depending on the head turning preference they will find out how the incoming stimuli are uh, getting processed. Now, here the bilinguals were English Japanese bilinguals and so English and Japanese have opposite word order. So, English is a VO language whereas, Japanese is OV language. So, this is an example of English whereas, in Japanese the, uh, the same sentence will be said like this. So, eat the apple here it will be apple eat something like Hindi also apple khana, apple khao eat, the, eat an apple egg apple khao. So, similarly Japanese and English had the same kind of opposite or word order. So, the task was infants were first made to hear a stream of nonsense syllables consisting of frequent and infrequent syllables like this and then they were played syllable stream that were characteristic of either OV or VO. So, first they were made to listen to nonsense uh, syllables and then they were played uh, syllables either in VO structure or in OV parsing strategy. What they found out was when bilinguals heard stream of OV prosody they, they tend to look longer and or surprised. When they heard stream with VO prosody 
they showed opposite pattern of looking which means the at 7 months of age the bilingual brain bilingual infants brain is capable of distinguishing between these two patterns. However, monolinguals were not able to parse the stream of OV prosody and defaulted to VO parsing strategy even when they heard stream with no prosody. So, there is this difference that they found out. Similarly, there have been studies on consonant uh, perception as well. Different languages use different phonemes, consonant contrast and vowel contrast. So, that is a common difference among languages. So, by the end of the first year, bilingual infants typically perceive many consonant contrasts that the that are important in their native language. So, in for example, in Indian languages, we have uh, within the villa stops, we have four way difference in terms of voicing and in terms of aspiration. So, bilingual infants start um, understanding this, perceiving this kind of uh, contrast in their language, in their the sound of their languages in the very first year. So, studies have found that bilinguals are better than monolinguals at discriminating non-native contrasts. So, at by the by age 1 they already know how to contrast them in their native language and they can also do the same in case of their non-native languages. Now, this could be because perceptual development of bilinguals can be one of the reasons both monolinguals and bilinguals follow same pattern of perceptual narrowing. This is universal whether the child is bilingual or monolingual perceptual narrowing happens. But bilinguals take longer to reach a mature stage of speech perception and bilinguals also have a uh, perceptual advantage. They maintain an enhanced sensitivity to speech sound contrast simply because they are exposed to two different languages. The brain is aware of that contrast constantly because of the environment. Another study they looked at, um, they tried to investigate if bilingual infant brain responded to the difference between ta and the sound. So, participants were 11 month old Spanish English bilinguals and English monolinguals. So, English monolinguals were the control. They had this was an MEG study. Now, you can see a very cute picture here that uh, that are this is from the study in the, from the paper. So, the infants were made to hear intermediate sounds repeatedly and their response was measured using an MEG. Measurement was done in two time windows. There was one was 100 to 260 millisecond and there was 260 to 460 milliseconds after the stimulus. So, for T, the English contrast no differences were found between monolinguals and bilinguals in either time window. For D, this is the Spanish contrast. Bilinguals showed a stronger neural response than monolinguals in both time windows. So, while infants by brains responded most to the languages they were acquiring which is not the case with monolinguals. So, that was that was a rather striking uh, finding. Vowel perception similarly have been um, looked at vowel contrast just like we have um, consonant uh, contrast across different languages similarly vowel contrast have also been looked at. So, there was a particular study that looked at uh, discrimination between the sound A and A contrast using an anticipatory eye movement paradigm. So, this was uh, eye tracking study. Here again the children were 8 month old Spanish Catalan bilingual infants. So, task was infants were watching an animated Elmo character disappear into a T shaped tunnel and then emerge on the other side, one side of the other or the other. So, there was a T shaped uh, tunnel uh, in, inside which the Elmo character disappeared and then reappeared from this. The E sound predicted Elmo's appearance on the right side and the A sound predicted his appearance on the left side. So, this was entirely an animated uh, sort of a task because as we said that very small children cannot be uh, made to take part in a typical linguistic related task. So, this was an eye tracking study where they used animation and there was a connection made between the sound and the sight of reappearance of the character. E with right side, A with left side. What they found was both monolingual Catalan and bilingual Sp uh, Catalan Spanish infants they succeeded which they could do if only they perceived the difference between the so two sounds because they were already exposed to this. So, they were so basically if there was a sound and they what they are trying to see if the sound A as soon as they heard whether their eyes moved to the predicted position or not. 
that way that, that way they will know that this contrast between the two sounds have been identified by the brain and the bilinguals and monolinguals were found to do well because this contrast exists in their language. Then child L2 learners, so these are second language learners, they are not simultaneous, they are sequential bilingual. Uh, what they, the, the studies on phonological development in child L2 learners predate their similar studies on bilingual uh, infants naturally because these children are slightly uh, more, more uh, capable of handling an experimental setup. So, these studies have been taking place for quite some time. However, in studies on infants are pretty recent because only now we have uh, sophisticated machinery that will not scare the kids off. So, uh, and also the various paradigms that have been developed. So, one of the earliest studies goes back to 1978 on this kind of second language learners uh, among children. The participants were English speaking children and adults who had recently moved to the Netherlands. So, children and adults who were actually in a native speakers of English but living in Netherlands for, um, for a long time. So, depending on at the age when they arrived, the, there were different groups. So, the task was many aspects of the participants L2 knowledge, L2 in this case is Dutch that was tested including grammar, pronunciation, storytelling and auditory discrimination, discrimination between different uh, sounds. So, all the groups improved over the course of testing. So, they were, uh, they were tested on different uh, timelines. So, they were, there, was a, there was an improvement. Children aged 12 to 15 did the best in any group of any group. This was a very interesting finding of this study and they were found to be doing better than both the smaller children and the adults. And um, even during the first testing se session, a short six months after arriving in the Netherlands. So, even though they had arrived in this new language environment only uh, in the six months uh, prior to the experiment, they were still showing much better performance than the rest of the group. As a result of which they concluded that the, that critical period hypothesis, remember we talked about critical period hypothesis during language acquisition uh, module. So, this study negates the critical period hypothesis uh, SLA will including phonetic perception because this is ages, this is uh, beyond the critical period after uh, 12 years. So, between 12 to 15 years is not at all within the critical period and still they were found to learn the patterns of language behavior in their L2 within a very short span of time. Consonant perception similarly, study of children's L2 consonant perception have revealed various different development patterns. In some cases, children seem to acquire non-native contrast very quickly, while in other cases they show more difficulty. So, here we see that there it is not a blanket uh, generalized sort of a pattern. There are in some domains we can see a better performance compared to some other domains. So, where we have evidence that children's perception of L2 consonant improve rapidly, part, uh, particularly compared to adult L2 learners. Consonant uh, contrasts and consonants themselves it is a, a complex domain of um, uh, L2 learning and in this, in this case children are found to do better than their adult counterparts. So, in one such study they studied a group of English learning children, uh, so English is L2 here who had grown up in a Sileti speaking community in London. Sileti is a language uh, spoken in Bangladesh as well as in some parts of Assam in India. So, this, this is a basically a Sileti English bilingual community. Uh, so, English they were trying to find out English learners um, they compared them to a group of native English speaking monolingual children on their consonant perception of the two pairs ka ga and b and ba and pa. This kind this contrast they were trying to find out if they are able to distinguish. Participants were small children 4.5 years of age. So, the task was like this children heard a word across several trials and had to point to a picture representing the word they had heard. Okay? So, they will hear a word and they, there was a corresponding picture they had to point to the picture. They were presented with words across a range of VOT values. So, the words had consonants with different VOT. 
so that researchers could pinpoint where they place their boundaries. So, where does so basically the, the based on the VOT feature um, you already know what is VOT voice onset um, time feature. So, depending on the VOT value the sound the character of the sounds ka and ga will differ. So, they were trying to find out the boundaries of the sounds or the sound contrasts and what they found was native speakers and L2 learners showed similar performance overall. Both groups located the consonant boundaries in approximately the same place and became both and uh, both more were more consistent and more adult like in their categorization abilities over time. So, they were not doing poorly at all. These results suggested that children quickly acquired the perceptual skills to process uh, L2 consonants. So, he, these children were only 4.5 years of age however, they could uh, their um, boundaries their their uh, boundaries of this each of these sound contrasts were almost similar to the English monolingual children. Another study uh, compared Japanese um, adults Japanese and adults learning English. So, L1 is Japanese L2 is English here and they the the participants are Japanese speaking children aged 6 to 14 and their parents. So, children and parents both were uh, looked at. So, the consonants investigated in this uh, were the sounds sa and sa. These are, these are both are fricatives. So, these are the sounds that they were consonants that they were looking at. The task was participants heard three sounds and had to indicate which of the three was different from the other two. So, the odd one out test. And uh, both groups were tested twice and first around 6 months after arrival in the US and then again another after one and a half years. So, there was a time lag between the two uh, tests once as soon as they arrived almost as soon as 6 months and after another uh, one and a half hour years. So, basically trying to see if their ability to distinguish between the sounds increased over a period of time or not. Simultaneously, they were also looking at the difference between the children and the adults performance. So, both the, the children and adults showed difficulty uh, in this task compared to native English as you can uh, already expect. However, over time they showed improvement as they spent more and more time in the US uh, English language speaking environment, their cap capacity to distinguish the sounds became uh, got better. Uh, even then children performed much worse than all the other groups. Now, these results suggest that it may take some time for child uh, children learners to accurately perceive the L2 speech sound. So, there are varied uh, findings in each of these domains in vowel identification, consonant identifi identification, consonant contrast identification, vowel contrast identification depending on various tasks and age group there are, there are different kinds of uh, results that we see. Vowel perception again in some cases children accurately produce L2 sounds that they have they have seen. So, sometimes there are differences between perception and production as well. So, while they had difficulty in perceiving they had done better in production step pr producing the same sound. So, there are all of these um, differences that have been reported. So, one of these studies is Darcy and Kruger 2012. They examined the vowel perception and production in children growing up in Germany who spoke Turkish at home. So, this is the L1 and this is the L2. So, German L2 Turkish L1 uh, children. So, children between uh, 9 to 12 years and they have started learning German in their preschool. So, by the time they are in preschool their L1 is already established and hence they are a L2 learners of German in this case. So, the children were tested on their discrimination of several different German vowels previously classified as either difficult or easy for monolingual Turkish adults to discriminate. German vowel system is different from the Turkish vowel system as a result of which there are some vowels which are typically more difficult to learn by Turkish uh, monolingual speakers. So, children heard the three different robots each produce a nonsense word. These were different uh, they were nonsense word each having a different vowel and had to uh, decide which robot was saying something different. So, they, these are the sounds that the robot was producing and they had to find out which was different, which sound was different. So, basically the task was to create nonsense word and try to see if the, the, the Turkish speakers could identify the difference between the different German sounds. 
So, the bilingual children were less able to discriminate the difficult contrasts, but equally able to um, uh, discriminate the easy contrast. So, difficult contrast they were found finding it more difficult, easy contrast more easy. When it was they were uh, measured on their ability to produce the same vowels in real German words, monolingual and bilingual showed sim having, having uh, highly similar production. What this basically takes us to is that production of the contrasts were found to be easier as opposed to perceiving those vowel contrasts. This is something that has been found by many other uh, studies as well and there are many uh, possible explanations that have been uh, put forward. So, production task used familiar German words and whereas the perception task was based on uh, uh, non words which could have been in this particular case, case could have been one of the uh, reasons and there were similarly many other reasons also given. Yet another study looked at um, differences in how learners perceive versus produce vowels again and here the children were 9 to 17 years and um, similarly they had done uh, perception and production study. This also revealed that unlike their performance and perception production of the same vowels were as good as the monolingual. So, many studies have found similar kind of performance. So, even if um, perception tasks did not have good result, production task on the same vowels showed better results. So, one, one uh, area within this uh, domain has uh, that has studied been studied is the effect of base language. So, when interacting with um, another bilingual of the same uh, uh, of same L2 languages, a bilingual will be in a bilingual mode and this is the case where the base language will seem will have a have an impact on the overall uh, language production and perception. So, this uh, the shift to that language can be for a word, phrase, sentence and so on. So, base language effect is one uh, important area of research within this domain. This is still being this is um, the study in this domain is still undergoing. Now, we will look at production uh, system bilingual language production system uh, with some studies. This is again a rather vast area of research, but we will try to look at the main uh, points that have been raised in all these years. So, uh, language uh, activation states of the non-target language might differ based on certain factors like language mode which we have already seen. So, some studies that have looked into this one of the most uh, one of the uh, older studies is about by Colombia 2001 and this uh, study looks at how the mode can be changed in depending on the stimulus set. So, they had carried out uh, she had carried out a set of experiments with 83 high proficient Catalan Spanish bilinguals and uh, they had to decide whether a certain phoneme was in the Catalan name of a picture or not Sim a simple task of identifying a phoneme. So, they were shown a picture. So, the task was like this there will be a picture of so this um, picture whose, which uh, is that of a table. So, the picture of a table the word table is not present in the picture. So, only the picture of a table is there and then after that uh, this, uh, this is the Catalan name of, of table and then the task is they will be uh, uh, they will be shown three uh, they will be shown a phoneme. Now, how do you show a phoneme? Phoneme is a sound uh, a feature of a sound. So, they will be shown letters which has corresponding phoneme. So, they will be shown the uh, phoneme uh, ta and then this and then this. How are they different? The first phoneme is directly related to the picture. So, the question to the participants were was this phoneme part of the name of that picture. So, yes this is present there because it starts with the taule, taule or whatever. But this was this yes question yes so this is called yes trial. So, yes trial is not of interest for this study. What is of interest is the no trials both of these are no trials. So, they had a phoneme that was there was m uh, ma. Now, why is it interesting? It is interesting because the Spanish name for uh, the table is uh, Spanish name for table is mesa. Hence, this alphabet this phoneme exists this pa is part of the Spanish name of the same picture. Remember this is the Catalan Spanish bilingual uh, participant and then th this sound does not exist in either of the either in Catalan name or in the Spanish name. 
So, they were trying to see if there is a difference between M and P response. So, both will be no answer. The answer will be no for both of these uh, phonemes and they were trying to see if the, they take longer to respond to M because M is not present in the picture because the instruction was very clear that was this sound present in the name of the picture in Catalan not in Spanish. So, Spanish was not mentioned at all. However, if they take longer to respond to M that will mean that they were the second language was activated already. So, the non-target language which is the second language of the uh, other language of the speakers. So, what they found was they participants took longer to reject the phoneme appearing in the Spanish word than the control one. The control one is this one the unrelated. So, they called one was related the other was cross language related uh, relation third one was unrelated. So, unrelated obviously had they, they took very less time to reject, but the one which is actually not there, but they took longer time is the one that has connection to the other language of the speakers which is Spanish. So, this was taken to be uh, a proof of the second language being active because of the language mode in this particular case. The same pattern was replicated at different um, stimulus onset uh, asynchrony. So, different um, uh, SOA this is called SOA in experimental uh, paradigm. So, and they, they, they found same results. So, uh, SOA is basically the gap between the first uh, stimulus and the second. So, the picture and then the after looking at the picture when did the uh, phoneme appear. So, 2200 to 400 millisecond different kinds of gaps were utilized and everywhere they found the same kind of results. So, they concluded that both the target language and the language not in use were simultaneously activated. Now, this study was um, replicated after some time by another group and uh, here they had made some slight changes with the stimulus set. Now, in this study what they did was there were pictures right. So, pictures were um, some of them were target pictures and some of them were filler pictures. Target pictures had target picture had this kind of a structure this is how they uh, created the design. And they also had filler pictures, filler pictures which were not non-target pictures. Now, this task was replicated by the 2011 study. However, they made a slight change in terms of the filler pictures. What they did was they had on the filler picture, the objects that they presented as filler pictures, they had divided them into two types. One was cognate, uh, the words that were cognate, another was non-cognate words. In the previous study, they did not really uh, take this as a variable in the study. However, they had um, in the filler pictures, they had both cognate and non-cognate words uh, as filler words. But in this particular study, they tried to look at whether the cognate status of the filler words had any impact on the findings. So, they had three different um, parts of the same study. In one, they used cognate, in another, they used non-cognate words. Language pair was Dutch English in this case and the pictures are like this. So, they had a uh, again the similar kind of design everything remaining same. The picture was bottle and target phoneme was this. This was the um, non-target language. So, language uh, cross language condition because the Dutch name for uh, bottle is plus I do not know how to pronounce this, but this sound exists in the Dutch version of the same picture and then this sound is not related to either Dutch or English. So, they found that the pictures were chosen in such a way that half had English names and, uh, and had a translation equivalent in Dutch like bottle and the filler pictures were whose names were also non-cognate. So, in the first version of the study, they had filler pictures which whose names were non-cognate. The results showed that there was a difference between cross language and uh, non-related uh, identification. So, there was no difference between these cross language and non-related versions. So, when the filler pictures were all non-cognate words, there was no difference found in these two uh, within these two categories. However, in part 2 of the experiment, they had the filler pictures where uh, those words that were cognates like this kind of a uh, these are cognates across Dutch and English language. So, this the second part of the study changed the filler words into cognates and this time uh, the two critical conditions the, the two critical conditions are these two. 
So, the one which has a cross language um, uh, condition and another which is non related condition. So, these two critical conditions had difference in both response latency as well as accuracy. Response latency is the reaction time, the time taken to respond as well as accuracy. So, cross language condition took longer and also were less accurate. The conclusion in this uh, study was that non target language was activated. So, you see the difference in this study um, uh, with the Colum study 2001 that in the first study there was um, the fillers were not differentiated in terms of cognitive status. In the second study once the you ch change the filler, filler words and uh, look at the cognitive status the, and thereby you create two different set of stimuli. One set of stimuli had uh, non cognate words as filler words in the other one there were cognate words. When there were cognate words used as filler they had found a um, very different uh, and they had found a difference in terms of accuracy and latency in the uh, between the two target conditions. So, basically what we are trying to say here is that when you have used cognate words as filler words this is indirectly putting the subjects uh, the participants in this case in a bilingual mode and once that bilingual mode has been activated you automatically see the impact of the say, other language which is not being used currently impacting the reaction time. But if you do not use the cognate words you are using only non cognate words that means they were not activating the bilingual <coughs> mode. So, the activation level of the non target language can be manipulated and once that is manipulated you see a very different result in the experimental setup. Similar uh, findings have been reported by other studies also. So, various um, uh, this was only the uh, one domain, but other other researchers have looked at use of material interlocutor code switching behavior and so on trying to modify uh, using these variables and modulating the uh, modifying the uh, test and they found different language behavior. So, uh, each of these each of these variables can have an impact on the language mode which in turn will have a different ling language uh, production behavior. So, uh, one can look at all these studies there are many others, but these are the ones that are most well known. Now, we will look at so we have uh, now we have sort of a baseline created as to what are the different types of patterns that have been observed in terms of bilingual production in terms of speech per perception and production. So, perception of sounds and production of sounds ability to discriminate and so on. Now, we will look at an overall picture about um, bilingual uh, language uh, uh, in terms of phonological transfer. So, language interaction in terms of phonological transfer. So, at take a longer long view now and see what kind of interaction happens between the sound systems of L1 and L2. So, uh, more studies more uh, there are lots of work on L1 to L2 transfer this has been um, a favorite of researchers to see how much of your L1 phonological structure impacts the understanding perception as well as production of your L2 phonological structure. So, we have a lot of studies um, there are many uh, domains within which this has been studied, but the most important ones are segmental transfer, featural transfer supra segmental transfer and phonotactic transfer these are the most important ones of course, there are many other domains as well. So, let us look at each of them uh, one by one. So, segmental transfer basically uh, looks at the uh, segmental aspect of phonology. So, sounds um, the of one language how they impact the sound perception and production of sounds in the second language. This is this studies this line of studies goes back a long time one of the earliest ones uh, and most well known ones are from these two uh, studies groups uh, looking at Japanese Japanese native speakers learning and speaking in English and their difficulty that they find in distinguishing between the r and l sound. So, these are the two liquids in English that the Japanese have particular difficulties with and this study goes back all the way to 1971. So, Goto used uh, natural uh, stimuli and tested both perception and production in English language by the Japanese speakers. On the other hand Miyawaki uses used uh, synthetic stimuli and tested only perception. Both of these studies had Japanese uh, native speakers as who are L2 speakers of English. Both studies reported lower accuracy scores for Japanese in both production and perception primarily taking us to how difficult it is for the Japanese speakers to distinguish between these two sounds. 
So, these are the uh, older ones. Similar studies have been now carried out uh, recently as well. So, in one such study, they showed that even Japanese speakers living in English language environment for many years still has the same difficulty. So, it is not only when you are learning the L2, but even after spending years. Remember, we have looked at this issue before also that exposure, a number of years and age of acquisition, age of arrival in the uh, L2 dominant, dominant language environment, all of that have has uh, all of that typically have been found to have an impact. But in this particular case, the study was replicated on Japanese uh, speakers who have been living in an L2 environment for many years still had found difficulties. So, they had found similar difficulties in L2 specific consonant contrasts. Similarly, there are many other studies for example, there are studies on French and in NS stands for native speaker, native speaker. So, French native speakers trying to identify the contrast between the and the and ra and wa contrast in English. So, French speakers who do who are speaking in English, they have they have found difficulty in distinguishing different kinds of uh, contrasts that exist in their L2, but not in their L1. Similarly, English native speakers learning Chinese um, Chinese language as Mandarin Chinese as uh, as L2 have found difficulty in affricate fricative contrast. So, Chinese language has affricate fricative contrast which English does not have. So, as a result of which English speakers when they start to learn Mandarin Chinese, they have found difficulty. Again another study uh, with Spanish native speakers looking at Catalan contrast of E and A also found the same kind of difficulty which we have seen recently, which I have talked about. So, st studies like this highlight the difference between L1 and L2 phonemic inventory. So, if um, if your two languages have uh, different uh, phonemic inventory, then there will be a difficulty in terms of um, what you find easy and what you find difficult. So, if the phonemic inventory does not include the, the, the distinguishing the distinct um, properties or a uh, difference or something uh, some other such differences, then L, when uh, your L2 has those distinctions, then it will be difficult for the pa participants to uh, process them either in perception or in production. Another area within this is uh, called featural transfer. Now, featural transfers are slight featural properties are slightly different from segmental properties. Featural uh, trans um, properties are like length, stress, etc. These are part of every language. So, at the level of sounds, you are you have sounds and then you have these added properties which are like length. So, length long vowel versus short vowel, long um, uh, stressed consonant versus non stressed consonant and so on. So, these, these factors are, um, are important variables in certain languages, but not important variables or not let us say they do not exist in the contrast does not exist in some other languages. So, that is where we also find differences. So, L2 learners are typically found to have difficulty if these uh, features are present in L2, L2 but not in L1. So, length is one such uh, property. In such circumstances, some uh, speakers whose L1 does not make use of this temporal feature have been found to be unable to perceive the same in their L2. So, one such case has been reported on Russian Estonian bilinguals by uh, in a 2011 study. In some other cases, the same was not observed. So, there are some differences uh, in terms of findings. So, Catalan learners of English, they, they did not find the same kind of result. English learners of Japanese find it difficult to distinguish between Japanese long and short consonants and vowels. Indian languages also have long short consonant uh, vowel distinction, uh, Japanese also has. So, English and native speakers who are learning Japanese, uh, they find it difficult to distinguish between those two because English language does not have that contrast. Similarly, Finnish and Swedish uh, ESL learners find it difficult in perceiving the syllable final fricative this this difference between sa and za sound. So, in English language what happens if this this consonant. So, if this is preceded by depending on the environment of the word that they are realized differently. So, in this case this will be the sa sound piece and this will be peas. So, the sound here is s the sound here is z. Now, this is typical of English, but not of Finnish and Swedish. 
So, as a result they found that Finnish and Swedish ESL uh, learners, English as second language learners were finding it difficult to make this distinction. This is, this is a very important uh, distinction what final fricative versus uh, what final fricative distinction in sa and za sound. Similarly, temporal inaccuracy, location of the boundary between long and short segments etc. are also investigated. The, this area has been investigated by uh, various researchers in all of these domains of all of these featural domains. So, and they have been uh, they are important predictors of the difficulties that the learners will face in their L2 perception and production. So, for example, English speaking learners of French produced longer VOT than French native speakers, right. Similarly, um, French has the VOT in terms of VOT French and English uh, have differences. So, depending on uh, if the English speaking learners of French they are using French then their VOT character itself changes because they bring their own native speaker native languages VOT structure into their L2. Mandarin and Korean speakers of uh, ESL learners were found to produce longer vowel duration than their in than English native speaker because Mandarin uh, and Korean languages have the vowel length they have different uh, vowel lengths that is there which is not there that difference does not exist in English language. So, they bring that longer vowel system into English language as well. Spanish ESL speakers again they also show temporal inaccuracy in producing English vowels. Basically in a layman term this is what we mean by accent. So, accent is the if you ask somebody he says that, that you know you somebody speaks with a thick accent somebody has you know their um, the one, one way of identifying even if you are not looking at the person you do not know if you are just given auditory input uh, in India this is quite um, uh, quite common. So, you are just given auditory input uh, of English language spoken uh, English language uh, spoken by different people from different parts of the country. So, coming somebody coming from uh, Kerala versus somebody coming from Bengal versus somebody coming from Punjab you do not really have to look at the person you do not really need to know who the person is just by listening to the the way English is spoken you will know the person which part of the country the person belongs to because we typically say that they have the accent very strong accent. What is accent? this is accent. So, in terms of uh, linguistics, in terms of phonology this is what is accent. So, both featural and segmental as well as suprasegmental properties of the sound structure of a language that is what makes it accent. So, when you are bringing your L1 suprasegmental, segmental and featural properties into your L2 is what we call uh, you know somebody is speaking with an accent. So, in Spanish English ESL speakers they show temporal inaccuracy in uh, producing English vowels. So, the vowel length, vowel structure uh, you know various properties including VOT and etc. will be different across languages. So, when you bring that into your L2 is when we find the inaccuracy in, product, um, in, in per, uh, both per perception and production. In production we can talk about accent, in perception we do not get to see what is happening but we, uh, this, this is when you need an experimental setup. So, now let us move on to suprasegmental transfers. Suprasegmental transfers are on, uh, uh, suprasegmental properties are like word stress, tone etc. Tone is a feature of certain languages uh, across the world. Stress is again um, uh, stress can be at various levels word stress you know uh, the stress has many uh, subdomains within itself. So, in this domain advanced high proficient speakers of L2 are often found to perform like native speakers. So, proficiency is a factor. When we say that somebody does not have accent is typically when that person is high proficient in the second language. So, that is exactly what this, this find findings also suggest. So, non-nativeness is also common. So, some cases high proficient bilinguals will show better, better um, um, uh, production capacity however, in some cases they do not. So, one of the areas where we find that the L2 speakers will not have a native like uh, pronunciation or production let us say is stress error. So, stress error in L2 is found in L2 production among Chinese, Japanese and Spanish ESL speakers. So, Chinese L1. Japanese L1 and Spanish L1 uh, speakers who are learning English as second language they are found to have error in terms of stress, word stress. 
lack of sensitivity to stress related cues were also reported. So, there are cues that were given in the experiment, but they were not picking up on those cues simply because that does not exist in their L1. So, another area is the perception and production of lexical tones of a heavily researched area. Uh, here also we find a significant amount of influence of the L1 on the L2. So, studies have been conducted on uh, Cantonese, Japanese and English uh, native speakers are found to score poorly in identifying the tonal contrast in Mandarin. Mandarin Chinese is a tonal language. So, tonal con another thing to in keep in mind in terms of tone is that even though uh, many languages can be tonal, so uh, you can have you can speak L1 tonal language and learn L2 which is also tonal, but that does not make life always easy because the tonal contrast may be different. Each language has their own tonal map so to say and if there is the tonal non tonal difference then of course, the problems are uh, even more severe. So, this identification were found even after missing even after training. So, even after these uh, Cantonese, Cantonese is also a Chinese language which means this is there all they also have tone, English does not have tone, Japanese. So, these people they found um, they were not able to per correctly identify the tone contrast in Mandarin even after they were given training. So, before training, after training did not have much differences. Even tonal L1 may not benefit as tones are categorized differently in different languages as I just mentioned. So, for example, Mandarin tone perception and production among Cantonese was studied and results showed that uh, accuracy rates were not good in identify all the tones. In some tones there was better performance, in some of the other tones there are, there are 4 different tones. So, there are in some tones they were performing better, in some other tones they were not. So, if there is a contrast in the tonal pattern in L1 and L2 then there will be difficulties. Then we have uh, the domain called of phonotactic uh, properties, how phonotactic properties from L1 gets transferred to your L2. So, difficulty was found even among advanced learners in this domain. So, consonant clusters, vowel epithesis and so have been investigated within this domain. So, these are part of phonotactics in any language. So, English native speakers producing Polish words, Polish and uh, Czech words have very different consonant cluster as opposed to any other language that we know. So, very difficult, very different kind of consonant cluster. Now, this study looked at English native speakers who were speaking in Polish with consonant clusters that are illegal in English. So, Polish language has very different consonant clusters as I just said. So, some of those clusters are in illegal in English meaning they do not exist in English. So, those consonant clusters of Polish that are not possible in English, they found accuracy rate between 11 percent to 63 percent depending on various factors. So, as low as 11 percent has also been reported. But for those clusters that are legal in English, the accuracy was 94 percent. So, the consonant clusters in your language that are uh, that are uh, possible for example, this is a consonant cluster that is possible in English and this is also possible in Hindi. Right? If we have to identify a Hindi speaker has to identify a cluster like this in English, the accuracy rate will be higher. However, if you are made to identify a consonant cluster that does not exist in your language, accuracy rate falls. So, this is what the uh, finding primarily uh, uh, talks, talks about. Now, we will go to the L2 effect on L1. So far, we are looking at uh, some of the major uh, domains of L1 to L2 transfer in terms of phonological properties of languages. Now, let us look at L2 effect on L1, the transfer can also happen the other way around. So, even though uh, the typically what happens is if L1 is stronger or dominant language, chances are very high that you will see an L1 to L2 transfer more often. However, if L2 becomes more uh, dominant and stronger, then the others uh, opposite side of uh, influence is also possible. So, one of the first studies to report uh, this um, the opposite traffic was Flege 1987. So, they had found out that L1 categories were affected by L2 features. So, one of the features that they were looking at is English voiceless stops. Now, English voiceless stops have a longer VOT than French. English voiceless stops have a longer voice onset time compared to French. So, French has a shorter VOT, English has a longer VOT for the same voiceless stops. 
Now they further looked at English native speakers living in Paris for more than 11 years and they were found to produce English tops with shorter VOTs because they had been living in Paris for 11 years and they had been speaking French so probably their French have, has become dominant language and as a result of which the shorter VOT for voiceless tops in French has affected their VOT of the same stops in English language. So, now they are producing English voiceless stops with shorter VOT even though native speakers of English will have a longer VOT. Similarly, another study looked at American uh, students studying in Korean immersion program. So, English uh, native speakers uh, studying in Korean immersion program, they found a general lowering of F1 and F2 will values of all English vowels due to lower similar values in Korean. So, Korean vowels and the similar corresponding vowels uh, between English and Korean have different F1 and F2 values frequency uh, f1 and f2 values in terms of frequency in these two languages. So, English vowels have a um, higher value compared to Korean. So, Korean has a slightly lower value as a result of which after this participants had been studying in the Korean immersion program for some time their uh, vowels in English also had a lower f1 and f2 value. Similarly, another study looked at Russian monolinguals compared Russian monolinguals with Russian English bilinguals living in the USA. So, again Russian is L1, L2 is English, but they have been living in USA for many years. So, in Russian what happens in this language something called neutralization happens. What is neutralization? It is the devoicing of the word final consonant. So, in case of this kind of a word C O K O D code becomes K O T, the term the D transfers to the sound. So, this contrast involves stops and fricatives both in Russian, but this is this does not happen in English. This is common in Russian, but not in English. The bilinguals in this case showed less tendency towards devoicing in a reading. So, the reading test and the bilingual in Russian speakers uh, who were living in US for a long time showed less tendency towards this uh, neutralization process as opposed to Russian monolinguals meaning something that is very common in Russian language which is part of Russian phonetic system, phonological system was found to be uh, affected by the L2 uh, property in this particular domain. So, based on so, these are some of the studies, these are some of the domains of course, this is again I uh, must stress this that this is an area in itself phonological processing in uh, bilingual phonological processing is a rather uh, broad area of research. We have now looked at only some of the major um, properties, major um, domains of research with the basic findings in all of these. So, we will conclude this uh, module with a couple of models that, uh, that have tried to make sense of what is happening. Uh, there are many models in this domain, but we will look at uh, two of the most uh, more well known ones. So, theoretical very uh, several theoretical frameworks have tried to account for the phonological processing as well as development of in the non native language. What happens when a person learns a second language? What, what are the phonological changes and the nature of that change and how those changes develop over a period of time? These are the areas that have been looked at. So, one model trying to look at it is the SLM model, speech learning model. This model deals with the issue of production and perception of L2 phonology at segmental level. And it has three basic assumptions that uh, one is perception and production are related, they are not separate uh, processes, they are related processes. So, if perception is accurate, then production will also be accurate. So, uh, this is a this is a two way traffic. So, perception and production are connected production is dependent on perception to a large extent as per as this model is concerned. L1 and L2 sounds exist in a common phonological space. So, both L1 and L2 sounds are part of a larger uh, common phonological space which is something that many other models have also talked about in terms of the uh, models we looked at by Mola and other models. So, they talk about a common phonological space which has subset of L1 phonology and L2 phonology. Adults have the same capabil capability or in learning native like phonology in L2 as children learning their L1. These are the basic presuppositions of the model uh, called speech learning model of S or SLM this was given by Flege. Uh, 
1995 and has been updated many times. So, this is one of the models. And the other model is um, what is called the perceptual assimilation model or PAM. This was, uh, pro this was proposed by Catherine Best. Now, this model is slightly different, uh, the focus is different in this model. Uh, this is uh, this model looks at how a language specific phonological skill is developed. So, this particular uh, model is uh, has a much uh, focused, a uh, narrower focus on in terms of phonological uh, development in infants. So, development of specific phonological skills, language specific phonological skills and how it develops in infants. This is um, while they learn their L1. So, while a child a little a small child from their birth till a couple of a few years of their age how the phonological skill set develops, phonological skill set uh, specific to the particular language that they are learning how that development happens is what the model looks at. So, this is slightly different from SLM and uh, a lot of studies actually take into account both SLM and PLM together to understand the way the phonological development in takes place in L1 and L2 and how the interaction typically happens. So, this is where we will conclude other facets of bilingual language processing we will discuss in the next module we will discuss in terms of word level processing and sentence level processing. So, this is where we conclude module 5. Thank you. Mm -hmm.